In this shocking novel of a young girl alone in the streets, Goins delves into yet another facet of the ghetto experience, dark, despair-ridden world of a black girl's soul. Sandra took to the streets when she was eight years old and tried to fight off the hunger pangs by shoplifting and moving into the profits of drug pushing. Then she met Chink and discovered love and affection and rape and murder. Dedication In the memory of a very good friend of mine, Archie Walker, who was killed at Detroit Metropolitan Airport on November 1st, 1973, shot down in the parking lot by killers who didn't have the sense to get it for themselves. They had to try and take it from him. Hujambo, and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I will continue with this hard-hitting miniseries, Black Girl Lost, penned by the master surveyor of the streets himself, Mr. Donald Goins. Hold tight, everybody, and let the reading commence. Chapter 5 Sandra walked around the apartment aimlessly. The past few weeks had been a nightmare come true, but now it was over. She had finally been released on probation for striking an officer, while Chink had been sent to juvenile until he became 18. Well, it wasn't too bad, she told herself for the thousandth time. It could have been worse. They had tried to pin something on her, but it had been impossible because she had never made a sale nor ever handled any of the dope. So eventually, they had had to let her go. That she worked every day went in her favor, but from the small taste of law she had seen, she didn't want any more of it. For a black person to become involved with the law was trouble, spelled with large letters. It didn't make any difference if you were guilty or not. If you were black, that was good enough to find you guilty. Well, she decided, she wasn't in any bad shape. She had over a thousand dollars in cash money, plus there was over a thousand dollars worth of dope stashed around the apartment. The dope, she decided, would have to be left alone until she could figure out some way of moving it. It wouldn't be that much of a problem, though. If she could get in touch with the right drug addict, then the problem would solve itself. But common sense told her to take her time and use some kind of caution. It would work out better in the long run. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, taking Sandra out of her daydreams. She peeped out the window before opening the door. Hi, George. Betty, Sandra spoke politely as the couple came into the apartment. As she closed the door behind them, she wondered idly what could they possibly want. Ever since the day Chink had used them to purchase the apartment for them, she hadn't seen them, except for one other occasion when they had come by and tried to buy some dope from Chink. She remembered his anger. He had gone into a rage because they had come to his home on such an errand. If there was one thing he didn't do, that was sell dope from his home. And the only reason they knew where he really stayed at was because he had had to use them to get the apartment. Have a seat, Sandra offered as she waved her hand in the general direction of the couch. George was a tall, dark complexion addict with a scar on the side of his face, while his woman, Betty, was just the opposite of him. She was light complexion, with a blonde wig. Where he was tall, she was short and stocky. Her mouth was large, while her eyes had a dazed look about them, as if she was tripping out on LSD or something. We was wondering, George began, uh, since Chink got busted, if we could cop from you. He raised his hand before she could interrupt. I remember what Chick said about coming over here trying to cop. But since he is busted, I kind of thought that maybe you might be handling the stuff yourself. Maybe. He stared at her closely, his eyes never leaving Sandra's face. Well, first of all, Sandra replied, I ain't dealing no stuff. She hesitated slightly, then added, But there is a few drugs left. I was thinking about getting in touch with you to see if you wanted to handle it for me. It ain't that much, really. And after you get rid of it, there won't be any more, because I don't have Chink's Connect. She stopped suddenly, then corrected herself. I mean, George, if by chance you would want to handle a little bit of stuff I got and help me get rid of it. She shrugged her shoulders and was so involved with what she was saying that she didn't notice the gleam that came into George's eyes at the mention of his handling some drugs. 
How much stuff do you have? he asked, not able to conceal the greed in his voice. A warning bell went off in Sandra's head. She studied him closely, then asked quickly, Well, how much stuff did you come to buy? She had a sudden inspiration and added, You might be purchasing all the stuff I got. She couldn't help but notice the way his shoulders dropped at her words, as if she had knocked out his main daydream. Oh, he said dejectedly, We didn't want but a $25 spoon. He hesitated, then continued, I know that won't wipe out your supply. At least I hope it don't. No, I don't think that will wipe out my supply, Sandra replied, putting him at ease. Y'all excuse me for a minute, she added, then walked off to the bedroom. She removed the dope from the toe of one of her shoes and counted out the balloons. It was a good thing that Chink had already mixed and measured out everything, she reasoned, as she counted out nine $25 balloons. For a moment, she wondered if she was doing the right thing. George and his woman were the only addicts that she really knew, so it didn't leave her too much of a choice. Oh well, she reasoned as she walked back into the living room. She didn't have that much to lose. If they didn't return with the money, the loss of the dope wasn't that much, as far as she was concerned. She still had 22 more balloons left, and the sooner she got rid of them, the better off she'd feel. Here, George, she said, handing him the dope. There's eight $25 balloons there, plus the one you just bought. Sandra waited until George had counted out the bags of dope she had dropped in his hand. It's $200 worth of stuff there, George, but all I want for it is $125. You'll make $75 out of it, she added. Shit! He exclaimed loudly. It ain't really enough dope here for me to start dealing. By the time people get the wire that I've got some stuff, I'll be out of it. He lifted his eyes and stared at her closely. You mean to tell me that this is all the dope you got? He asked harshly. For a brief second, Sandra was startled by the tone of voice he used. Then she pulled herself together. It ain't none of your business how much stuff I got, George. But if you don't think I've given you enough to handle, just give it back. Ain't nobody twisting your arm making you sell it. I told you from the start that I didn't have that much. Now, if you want to down it for me, cool. If you don't, that's cool too. Her voice hadn't risen, but there was a firmness in it that couldn't be ignored. From the way George tightened his fist with the dope in it, there was no doubt that he wanted the dope and had no intentions of giving it back. As Sandra examined him, she began to really doubt her actions. She knew at once that she had made a mistake giving the drugs to George. She tried to straighten it out. When I went up and saw Chink last weekend, he suggested that I offer you the chance of getting rid of the few bags that I got. He wants me to bring the money up and put it in his account so you do what you want. I'm only carrying out his order. At the mention of Chink's name, George's face changed. There was little doubt about it. The man was afraid of Chink. How much time did you say Chink was doing? He asked suddenly. I didn't say, she replied quietly. But if you want to really know, I'll gladly tell you. He's got to stay in jail until he turns 18. His birthday is in February, so I believe he'll go to the parole board sometime this year. More than likely, six months from now. She knew she lied, but from the facial expression George made, she deemed it well worthwhile. If George had any intention of putting shit on her for the money, he'd have second thoughts about the matter now. But to put your mind at ease, George, whenever you get rid of that dope I gave you, I still have enough to give you another bag. As the words Sandra spoke penetrating his scheme in mind, George smiled. As long as he knew there would be some more dope waiting whenever he got rid of this small amount, he could get his game together. He didn't have any intention of ever bringing her all the money. All he had to do was figure out a way to get the rest of the stuff from her. Since it ain't but a small amount of dope, Sandra, I don't see why you don't just give it all to me now. That way, I won't have to be rushing over here trying to catch up with you when I run out. If I had all the dope, you wouldn't have to worry about the police coming in on you and finding something either. For the first time since entering the apartment, Betty spoke up. Yes, indeed, Sandra. The best thing you could do would be to give all that shit to George. That way, you won't have no worry. I'll bring you the money as soon as George gets rid of the jive. In the silence that followed, you could hear the wind blowing outside. The tree branches could be heard as strong winds rocked them back and forth against the building. Sandra watched the scheming couple closely. She felt like she was being enclosed with two snakes. I would if I could, George, but you wouldn't want me to go against Chink's order, would you? 
every time she mentioned Jink's name, there was a noticeable change in George. This time, sweat broke out on his forehead. He glanced at his woman, then asked, well, Sandra, since we'll be only doing business with you, Chink wouldn't even have to know now, would he? He winked at her as if they were plotting something together. Oh, yes, Sandra answered quickly. I don't never do nothing against what Chink has said. Right now, I'm wondering if I should tell him about this conversation when I go up to see him this weekend. There was no way for him to hide his fear now. His knees started to shake uncontrollably. Don't do that, honey. I mean, I just mentioned it, that's all. We'll do it just like Chink wants. Yeah, just the way he wants it done. I was just offering my opinion, that's all. Twenty minutes later, Sandra was rid of them. She sighed with relief after they left. It had been a mistake to give them as much dope as she had, but it was too late to worry about it now, she reasoned. After taking a hot shower, Sandra went to bed and sleep came slowly. She tossed and turned most of the night until the early morning traffic could be heard. Then she suddenly fell asleep. She slept soundly until a loud knock awakened her. She sat up and rubbed her eyes. She didn't have the slightest idea of who it could be. After all, no one really knew she stayed there. She slipped a light green wrapper around the transparent nightgown and went to the door. She glanced out the window first, and the sight of George standing there only angered her. She snatched the door open and demanded sharply, What the? That was as far as she got. Two other men pushed into the apartment. They had been concealed by staying close to the wall. The only way she could have seen them would have been to open the door and stick her head completely out of it. The taller of the pair waved a gun at her. Just shut your mouth, sister, and you ain't got to worry about getting hurt. Sandra backed up until she felt the coffee table strike her in the back of the leg. Then she stopped and stared at the gunman. The tall one was dark complexioned with a nervous twitch in his left eye. She kept staring at it, and it seemed to jump every minute. The other man, who only had a knife, was short and stocky, brown-skinned, and with a heavy black mustache. The men didn't pay any attention to George after pushing him into the apartment. Their complete attention was directed at her. The tall gunman advanced on her. We don't want to give you no trouble, little sis, so just tell us where the dope and money is, and you won't get hurt. There ain't no money. We spent all the cash we had on lawyers, she managed to say, before the pistol came down and struck her a vicious blow in the face. Pain exploded on the side of her head like she had never felt before. Then she could feel hands lifting her back up to her feet. For a moment, she wondered why she had fallen so easily. A male voice came through the fog that was trying to envelop her. Now, little sis, we know you got the stuff somewhere in this joint, so just set it out. The voice brought her back to reality. They wanted the little bit of money she had put up. She opened her eyes and saw the tall man leering down in her face. Where is it, girl? Don't try and be hard. Just set it out, he said, then slapped her across the face. She raised her hand and pointed at George. I gave him the dope last night, and he ain't brought no money back yet. Both of the stick-up men laughed. Yeah, that sure was some good dope you gave to old George there. But honey, don't you go expecting nothing back from that shit. You know George is a dope fiend, right? So he ain't gonna know how to handle no dope without shooting it all up. The shorter man said this in a heavy voice, then added, Now, if you was to give me an old tree here a bag, he said, pointing at his partner, you might just get some kind of money back for your trouble. Sandra knew the man was lying, but if she refused to give up the dope, there was no telling how far the men would go. She raised her hand and was surprised to feel blood running down the side of her face. Even if I gave you the rest of the dope, you wouldn't bring back enough money to pay my rent here, let alone enough for us to try to cop some more stuff with, she replied, fighting for time, trying to think of a way out. The two men smiled at each other. Don't you worry about it, little sis. Just give up the dope, the one called Trees said. For a minute, she hesitated. If she didn't do what they asked, she reasoned, they would use force. Okay. Okay, she said. Look in the closet, down in the red pair of shoes, in the toe. It's all that's left, she added. Tree had already rushed off. He came back out of the bedroom grinning, carrying the dope. 
Now, he said as he approached her, all you got to do is tell us where the money is, then we'll leave you all alone. It seemed as if her world was falling down around her. She had tried, but it hadn't worked. Yet, there was one thing she was determined to do, and that was hold on to the money at all costs. There ain't no money, she stated. If there had been, do you think I'd have taken a chance on giving him some dope? She pointed at George, then added, I must have needed money badly to take a chance like that. She noticed the men hesitate and glare at each other undecidedly. They had no way of knowing if she had any money or not, she reasoned. Tree moved suddenly. He stepped up and ripped her gown down around her waist. She opened her eyes and saw that she was half naked. Damn, girl, you ain't got no tits, but you was kind of young. If you don't want to be gorged, you better come up with that money. Wait, wait, she pleaded. You ain't got to do nothing. If there was any money here, I'd have given it to you when I told you where the dope was. God damn it, bitch, Tree cursed. We don't want no story. We want the cash. Nothing else. He slapped her across the face, then added, Either give it up or pay the motherfucking consequences. Whatever they were going to do, she reasoned, they do whether she gave up the money or not. I tell you, she cried out, I gave you everything I had when I told you where the stuff was. Please, don't you understand? I just don't have anything. Wait. Wait, she added, I might have $20 or so in my pocketbook, but that's all the money I have to live on until payday. I believe her, Tree's partner said. I don't think they have any bread, man. Tree shrugged his shoulders as he stared at her young body. Fuck it, he exclaimed, then reached down and ripped her nightgown completely off. He stared at her young right body. I want some of this young pussy anyway. George managed to mutter something for the first time since they entered the place. Tree turned on him in anger. Fuck you, punk! The bitch ain't gonna tell the police nothing! If she gets fucked, she just gets fucked, and that's it! What's she gonna say? We come in and robbed her of her dope, then fucked her? It's rape, man! Rape! George finally stated loudly, I didn't get into this shit for no pussy, man! Fuck that shit! I got all the cock I know how to handle at home! Well, go home and fuck it then, Tree replied coldly. Hey, Fred, cook up one of them bags of dope, man. If we're going to trim the young sister, we might as well make it good to her. Ain't no sense in us coming too soon, he said, and both the men burst out laughing. Fred slowly removed the outfit and cooker from his sock. He bit off the end of one of the balloons, but found another knot in the balloon. After biting that one off, he dumped part of the dope in the cooker. Don't put too much of that stuff in the cooker. It's good dope that ain't been cut to death, Fred. Plus, man, we want to be able to get the old bone hard enough to please Miss Lady. Sandra stared around wildly. She knew now that the men intended to rape her. She opened her mouth to scream, but Tree caught her in time. He jammed his hand over her mouth, then removed the dirty hanky from his pocket and stuck it down her throat. George, Tree said sharply, get off your trembling ass and come help us. Get in the bedroom and find me a sheet so we can tie this bitch up. I believe she might just put up too much of a struggle. We don't want no noise, you know. Man, I want to leave, George stated. I didn't have any idea y'all was gonna get pussy struck. Dope fiends too. Well, you ain't going nowhere, Tree answered shortly. I ain't had no young pussy like this in quite a while, he added, as he reached down and rubbed her leg. Without thinking, Sandra kicked out and caught Tree in the chest. The blow had been so swift that it took him by complete surprise. He tumbled over on his back. Like a cat, she was on her feet and streaking for the door. She tried to snatch the hanky from her mouth so that she could scream as she frantically snatched at the door. She managed to get the lock off and jerked the door open, only to find that the night chain was still on. Before she could close the door and release the chain, Fred was on her. He struck her from behind. The blow was hard and cruel. As she fell against the door, he whirled her around and hit her with a short right to the jaw. She crumpled up like a rag doll on the floor in front of the door. When she awoke, her feet were tied with strips torn from her sheet. She stared at the two men with fear. They were both nodding from the effects of the dope. 
For a moment, she hoped the dope had taken away the desire for sex. Well, well, well. Looks like our little old fox had finally awoke. I was afraid that Fred here had broken your jaw or something. Although that wouldn't have stopped the show. It might have stopped us from enjoying that mellow young head of yours though, Tree said as he came up out of his nod. He got up and crossed the floor, then knelt down beside Sandra. She turned away from him. Slowly, she became aware of his hands, probing, feeling, caressing her body. She caught her breath as his fingers slipped up inside her. He pushed two of them in as deep as they would go. As she closed her eyes to blot out what was happening, she became aware of the fact that now there were four hands fumbling around all over her. Chills raced up and down her spine. Her nerves arched as fear traveled from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. It felt like her bones and her flesh were being ripped apart from each other. Her throat went dry and her stomach flipped over as they put their hands up inside her. She tried to use her tongue to moisten her parched lips while she gulped until it looked like she was strangling. You keep opening your mouth like that, Tree said, and I'm gonna put something in it. She lifted her head in defiance as determination and anger overwhelmed her very being. Had they known her, the glare of absolute determination and hatred would have warned them that it wasn't over and wouldn't be over until someone was dead. As she felt the first man's dick penetrate her, the fear that had almost petrified her fled. In its place was a cold, chilling hatred. Go on, Fred. Put your bone in her mouth while I ride this cock, Tree said, breathing hard as sweat poured down off him onto her young body. The smell of the man almost overcame her as she glanced away from the sneering, slobbering man. His spit was dripping out of the corners of his mouth, and as the drops fell on Sandra, she twisted her head away and tried to scream. Fred glanced down into her eyes and shook his head. No bet to me, baby. I'll never give this bitch the chance to bite half my dick off, man. Don't worry about it, man, Tree replied. If the bitch tries to bite, I'll break her goddamn neck, he said seriously. Yeah, man, I know you will, but that ain't gonna do my pole no good. The bitch will probably die with it like a bulldog, dedicated to the end. No thank you, Tree. You put your dick in her mouth and let me do the choking if she bites. Tree didn't answer as he continued to plunge up and down. Man, this bitch is laying like a piece of wood, he finally said, then added, Nah, Fred, I ain't gonna take the chance either. Plus, the bitch ain't gonna suck it right no way. But I got a better idea. He removed his dick and rolled her over on her stomach. We just bust this cherry back here. I'll bet the bitch don't lay like no log then. Pain exploded in her anus. It felt like her very bowels were on fire. She tried to scream, but the hanky only made her gag. She swung her head from side to side wildly. Sandra prayed to die in her agony. It seemed as if the pain would go on and on, but she bit down on her lips and put up with it. Her tears only excited the two men more. They made animal sounds as they argued over the woman. Tree reached around her and picked her up by her small waist. He pulled her to him roughly as he slobbered on her neck, mouthing words of endearment. Aw, oh, baby, aw, oh, baby, I know it's good to you, he repeated over and over again until she passed out from the pain. Chapter 6 When Sandra regained consciousness, there was no one in the apartment but her. She stared around dully, then managed to untie her feet. The knots had been loose. She noticed that the color television was gone, but that didn't mean anything. She could always get another one. The pain in her rectum had passed, but she found that she had messed on herself. She got up and went into the bath. After a hot shower, she began to feel better physically, but mentally was another matter. What they had done to her was something she would never forget. 
She stared at her face in a mirror. There will always be a scar from where she had been struck with the gun. There was a long rip on the side of her face that would have to heal. She wondered how she could visit Chink this weekend, looking the way she looked. Well, it hadn't been her fault, so she'd go see him just like she was. That way, he'd really know what they've done. She was undecided as to how much to tell him. Some of what they did was too much to tell anyone. She was too ashamed. For the next two days, she ate, slept, and brooded. Her young mind was fertile for revenge. She knew without a doubt that something would be done, even if it took years of patient waiting. Saturday morning came, and Sandra took her time in dressing. She used a long bandage to cover the scar, but nothing could conceal her swollen lips. For a minute, she debated with herself whether or not she should go. This would be their first visit out in the prison yard at a picnic table. She had fixed lunch, fried chicken, a lemon pie, and soft drinks. It would be foolish to let someone else interfere with her and her man's enjoyment. After examining the Fred Astaire pants outfit she wore, she couldn't postpone the visit. She carried the lunch basket outside and set it in the trunk of the late model LTD Ford she had bought. It took two hours before she pulled into the state prison's camp area. The scene of the trees on the side of the road leading into the compound was a tranquil picture. A house sitting on the hill was a beautiful sight to the outsider, but to the 120 men at the camp program, it was the house of the lieutenant who had complete control of the men who were confined. Sandra parked the car and went up the walk like a hurt animal looking for its mate. The questions she had feared from the guards were avoided. From inside the wing of Chink's building, the brothers watched a slim black girl make her way up the wall. All of the men could see the bandage, but only one of them felt pain. Chink came off his top bunk in a smooth motion. Jimmy, the young brother who stayed under him, walked over. That's her, huh? Chink didn't bother to reply. His blood had run hot on sight of the bandage, and he hadn't really heard his friend's question. From the expression on Chink's face, Jimmy realized that his bunkmate was boiling. When Sandra reached the office, Chink was there waiting for her. He carried the picnic basket to the door for her. One of the officers on duty stood nearby. He watched the transaction through the window. Neither spoke to the other. Sandra just smiled brightly at him. After another guard had searched the basket, they were free to go. The policeman glanced at the bandaged up young girl but didn't comment. Sandra leaned against one of Chink's muscular black arms as they walked together towards the picnic area. She could feel his arm trembling with silent rage. A feeling of complete confidence filled the young black girl as she walked beside her man. Who was it? He asked quietly as he led her to a tree and spread the blanket she had brought. He knelt with an end of the blanket in his hand at her foot. As he stared up into her face, she could see the pleading in his eyes for the truth. Sander stretched her arms out to Chink, and when he came up to her, he took her in his arms. With her head on his chest, she talked slow at first, in a stuttering, shaken voice. At the tables beside them were children and parents playing and laughing. There was a holiday mood around the crowded tables. Prisoners walked back and forth introducing wives and sweethearts to friends. But no one came near Sandra and Chink. It was as though they were all by themselves on another piece of green velvet grass. Jimmy came down the walk with his girlfriend and the small child. The little boy could hardly walk. He was the only one who moved near the young couple. The other black inmates had steered clear of Chink, not out of fear, but out of respect. They knew that if he wanted to visit, he would. Do you think I was wrong in giving the dope to George Daddy? Sandra asked suddenly. She hadn't been watching his face as she spoke. She would have seen that Chink's eyes had gone from slits to balls of pure fire. Death was in his face. Sandra had spoken quietly for over a half an hour before she had asked a question. She had told everything just as it happened. His shirt was wet from her tears as she remembered the pain and brutality of the men. She didn't conceal anything. Just hearing that someone had struck his woman would have been enough to set him off. Sandra was his first and only love. He was like a caged animal. He wanted to strike out. He would never forgive or forget. 
the magnitude of what the Med did to his woman and men that he knew he could find, sent a cold deadliness through him that only the shedding of blood could remove. He knew Tree and his partner on sight, but they didn't know him that well. They had seen him, he knew that, and they knew he sold dope. But they had never done any business together. As Chink thought about it, he knew that they based their nerve on his staying in prison and in time making everybody forget. I don't think you did nothing wrong, honey, Chink said softly. The only mistake done was by the people who did this, he said, and kissed the bandages lightly. I'm glad you feel that way about it, she replied quietly. Sandra glanced up into Chink's face. She saw the wetness on his cheeks, and it touched her deeply. Her sorrow was his, and her pain was so close to him that he could almost feel it. Would you care for some refreshments? I have some cold soft drinks, Daddy. He nodded his head and watched her move gracefully to the basket. She fixed him a drink and a plate of food and set it beside him. When he noticed her about to close the basket, he said, Don't close it without fixing yourself something, baby. I want you to sure enough eat plenty. Cause from here on out, you might be busy. I may be coming home this week. Sandra sat down beside him and glanced around the compound. There was a softball field at the rear of the buildings with trees showing in the distance. There was no fence around the prison grounds. You'll need a ride, was all she said. There was no question about whether he was wrong or not. If he wanted to come home, it was his decision. He was the man and she would follow. She felt as if she was lost without him. She needed a man to love and protect her, and this was her man. The day passed slowly, and though the sun was hot, it was cool and peaceful under the tree. They ate and drank and made plans. Chink talked, and Sandra listened. That's the main thing, baby. You're going to have to get rid of the car, because by now they got the license and everything else, Chink said as he lit a cigarette. Sandra got a light off his cigarette and leaned back against the tree. It's strange, she said, how someone can do something and upset the plans of others. I wanted to save and have a lot of money for you when you came home. Now this. Life seems to be that way, baby. There's some things a man can accept and the others he can't, Chink replied quietly. A song drifted from someone's radio. It was Reach Out For Me by The Four Tops. The couple listened quietly to the words. Yes, they were reaching out for each other. As long as the timing is right, there should be no trouble. I'll come out right after count. Give me ten minutes to reach the highway through the woods. She glanced at a watch. I won't be late. If I am, you'll know something happened that I couldn't help. Don't take no chances. Move out. Move to a motel. Stay there. Don't even worry about the stuff there. Maybe get yours and a few of my clothes, but don't take no chances. Throw us a few things together and get the hell out of there. Chink spoke with emotion. His voice was husky and the worry in it could not be concealed. Sandra nodded her head in agreement. It was a touching moment for the young girl who had never had anyone love her before. To now have someone really care for her was too much for her to hide, and the tears ran down her cheeks unchecked. What's wrong, baby? Chink asked, surprised. I didn't mean to say anything that would upset you. It ain't that, Daddy. It's just that knowing that you really care, that you feel this thing as deeply as I do. Chink, baby, I want you to know that there's nothing under the sun that I wouldn't do for you. Do you believe me? For an answer, Chink held her tightly in his arms. Something was flowing between them then. It was a rare feeling that comes to only a few people in a lifetime. They knew that from then on, their lives would be woven together. No matter what hardships life might put in their way, it would be together that they would face them. Later in the afternoon, Jimmy's little boy slipped away from his parents. He wandered over toward the quiet couple. Sandra put out her arms and caught the young boy. Come here, sweetie, she cooed and laughed as the little boy grinned and ran into her arms. She kissed him on his cheek and held him up. For a few minutes, she played with the child and then his parents came running over to take him back. Damn, Chink, I'm sorry about that, Jimmy said as he came over with his wife. The little guy slipped off while we weren't looking. Chink waved his hand. Man, that ain't about nothing. I was wondering when you was gonna come over and introduce us to your lady. Jimmy grinned. Honey, he said, this is my best friend and bunk partner, Chink. Chink, this is my wife, Shirley. 
For a moment, Chink was embarrassed. He had never liked making introductions, nor meeting women, but he rose to the occasion. He turned and waved towards his lady Sandra, who was still holding the child. This is my lady Sandra. Why don't you and Shirley sit down and join us for a while? Visiting hours will be over soon, so let's have a little set. Fine, fine, Jimmy said. He went back and got his blanket and joined the couple. Shirley and Sandra were busy talking when Jimmy finally settled down. The men talked quietly for a while as the women played with the small boy. I wanted to ask a favor of you, Chink, Jimmy began. My woman don't have no car, man, so she has to catch the bus up here. I was wondering, man, if she could get a ride back home. You know, carrying the child and all, it's a drag on the fucking bus. Aw, oh, man, that ain't no favor. The women have probably settled that matter between them already, Chink said easily. Sandra overheard their conversation. Yeah, baby, Don already made plans for that. Don't worry about it. Jimmy, I got some pie in the basket and cake. If you should want some, you can also make yourself at home with whatever food you might want. I don't want to carry that mess back home, so fill your stomach up. Come on, man, Chink said as he got up. He had noticed that Jimmy's wife hadn't brought a lunch. It would have been too much trouble trying to carry everything on the bus. Jimmy was happy enough that she had shown up. Shirley, Sandra began, why don't you fix yourself something to eat too? I brought plenty of the shit along, so make yourself at home. Don't feel funny. I know you ain't had nothing to eat all day. Before Shirley could say no, Sandra added, at least fix something for the boy. Shirley grinned and got up and fixed a plate. The four young adults sat around and laughed and talked until the end of the visiting period. When the bell rang, none of them wanted to bring the beautiful afternoon to an end. Damn, Jimmy said sharply. It seems as if the time just flew by. They sat and watched the other people make their final embrace, pack up, and depart. Slowly, Sandra began to gather up the small bundle so that they too could leave. Chink held her close, kissing her on the neck while Jimmy hugged his wife. They walked back up the path from the picnic grounds and each man held his woman closely. The little boy trotted to keep up. Chink helped Sandra load the basket in the car trunk. Well, baby, I guess this is it. We're allowed to make that one phone call home this week, but the guard stands so close that I won't be able to say anything. If it should be called off, I'll tell you that I'll be expecting you up here the next visiting week. If not, then we'll go on with what I've planned. Thursday evening will be the day, Chink added quietly so that no one could overhear what he said. I understand, honey, Sandra replied just as quietly. Don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of my end. I sure you will, baby, Chink answered her quickly. I'm not worried about you taking care of what you're supposed to do. Everything should go like clockwork. Blacks don't generally run away from these camps, so they don't watch us too closely. It will be child's play. He kissed her again, then stood back as Shirley got in the car. Jimmy was holding his child tightly. He kissed the boy on the cheek, then put him in the car. His eyes had a watery glaze about them, but Chink didn't speak of it. He knew what the other man was feeling. Both men wanted to get in the car with the women so bad that they could damn near taste it. Visiting was nice, but parting was hell. They knew another week was about to begin, a week filled with dullness, boredom, and the bullshit work the men were given to do. The two men stood beside each other and watched the car until it faded in the distance. Then they turned and slowly walked back up the path that led to the dormitory. Each man was silent, full of his own thoughts. Before they reached the door, Jimmy broke the silence. When you leave, man, why don't you take me with you? He asked quietly. Leave? What gives you an idea like that, man? I ain't going nowhere for at least another two years. Don't con me, chink. I know goddamn well you're planning on pulling up from here. Ain't no way you're gonna tell me different. It's in your eyes, man. All over your face. Chink didn't answer right away. He just let his eyes run over the rolling, well-kept grass and the trees in the distance. If I should go, man, I'll pull your coat. But Jimmy, ain't no reason for you to run, man. Once you run, you're going to always be wanted. It don't make sense, Jimmy. I wouldn't want to see you fuck up your life like that. Jimmy stopped with his hand on the door. Man, I wouldn't want to go with you if it wasn't important, but my woman needs me. She ain't getting but $80 every two weeks, and it just ain't enough for her to make it on with the kid. 
He hurried on before Chink could interrupt. You see, man, we ain't got no people out here in California. We're both from the South, man, and all her people are back there. If I should run, I'd just get the fuck out of the state, that's all. I ain't did enough for them to really put out an all-points bulletin on me. I'm just small potatoes, Chink. I'd go back home and nobody will be the wiser. I'll let you know, Jimmy. I'd have to think about it, my man. I really would. This is something that came up out of nowhere, man. So you'll just have to wait until I make up my mind on what's the best thing for me to do. He hesitated, then added, I'll tell you this much, though. I ain't gonna let nothing, man. Nothing interfere with what I gotta do. If possible, I'll take you along, but we'll just have to wait and see. Later, when the chow bell rang, Chink and Jimmy stayed out of the chow line. They were both too full from the food they had eaten outside. Instead, they went into the playroom, which had two pool tables and one ping pong table. They shot pool for the next hour until cow time. At cow time, each man had to be at his bunk, standing in front of it. After the guard passed, they still had to wait until the all-clear bell rang. It generally came in minutes after the guard made his round. God damn, Chink. I can't seem to get that visit out of my mind. Let's go into the TV room. Is there anything good on tonight? Jimmy asked quietly. Chink shrugged his huge shoulders. I don't keep up with that shit, man. You know that. He still led the way towards the TV room. It was full of inmates. Some sitting in the front row, saving the best seats for their friends who hadn't got there yet. Chink walked up to the front row. Another inmate had put his jacket on two of the seats. Whose jacket? Chink asked, lifting the coat out of the chair. That's mine, man, the brown-skinned brother sitting next to the chairs replied. Them seats are saved, brother, he added. Yeah, I know, Chink answered sharply as he sat down. The seats are unsaved now, baby. Hey, my man, the inmate yelled. What you gonna do, man? Just grab the motherfucking seat? Chink stared at the man coldly. Listen, man, let me pull your coat to something. You use that weak-ass shit on these old fake punks or on some other of these brothers that don't know no better. But don't run that weak-ass shit down to me. These seats belong to the state, man, for any convict's use. Now, if your buddies can't get their answers down here in time to get a seat, they just have to find one where they can. You dig what I mean? The inmate Chink was talking to glanced nervously around. He saw his two friends enter the television room and gained courage. Listen, man, I don't want to hear that shit. I told you that the seats were saved. Now, if you want to try taking them, why don't you tell the brothers who they belong to about it? He had raised his voice so that his partners could hear the conversation. By now, all activity in the television room had come to a halt. The men had stopped whispering among themselves to hear what was going on in the front row. The habit of certain inmates saving seats, and generally the best seats, was a sore spot with many of the men. Most of them just overlook it because they didn't want any trouble over a seat in the damn television room which could cause them to get a flop at the parole board. Most of the time, Chink didn't bother to come into the television room, so he didn't come in contact with the problem. When he did come in, he generally sat somewhere in the middle rows, but tonight, he felt mean. He glanced up at the two brothers bearing down on him. Then he turned back to the man sitting next to him. The man was smiling as if he'd done something clever. Without warning, Chink slapped him across the face twice. The blows were so hard that they almost snapped his neck. God damn it, punk! Chink growled, I ain't for no fucking games, boy! He stood up and glared at the two men coming towards him. Both men stopped as if they had car brakes on their shoe heels. What they saw was danger. Chink's long arm seemed to jerk in the need to strike out at someone. Violence was written all over his face. A man would have to have been either blind or a fool to have not paid heed to the warning in Chink's expression. The man Chink slapped continued to sit, waiting to see what his friends would do. It didn't take long for him to realize that they weren't about to enter into the argument. What's the deal, Peterson? Chink asked the closest one of the men. The man called Peterson just shrugged his shoulders. Ain't nothing to it, Chink. I see you and my boy there done had a little run-in. Don't be too hard on him, Chink. He's a good kid. Yeah, I know what you mean, Chink answered, then added, but punks should stare in their motherfucking places. He still tried to push it. Chink didn't want to let it go at that. 
He wanted the body contact of a good fight, but Peterson wasn't having any of it. He raised his hands in a friendly gesture. Ain't nothing but a misunderstanding, my man. That's all. Just a misunderstanding. Before the words were out of Peterson's mouth, he had glanced around and seen two empty seats in another row. He led his friend towards the empty chairs. He was far from a fool. He had seen Ching's girlfriend show up with the bandages, and he knew from experience that the man was boiling for a fight. But Peterson wasn't having any of it. If he wanted to fight, he reasoned, as he sat down in a chair, it would be with someone other than the gorilla-looking chink. The man looked like an ape and was built like one. No, Peterson considered himself wiser than that. Jimmy sat quietly beside his friend while everything calmed down. He felt a cold shiver of fear at the wild swiftness of Chink's attack. He knew in his heart that he was afraid of the man who he slept under. Chink was just too unpredictable for him. He could explode in violence in a moment's notice. Chink sat in the chair for about five minutes, then got up. I think I'm going down to the gym and lift some weights, Jimmy. If you stay up here and run into any trouble, just come a-running, baby, and I'll gladly come back with you and handle it. He spoke loud enough for just about everyone in the TV room to hear. Okay, Chink, Jimmy replied. I think I'll just stay and watch this bullshit on TV. He hesitated, then continued. I ain't too good with that weightlifting shit, you dig? Chink reached down and rubbed his friend's head, messing up Jimmy's natural. It was something they did when they kidded around, which was really seldom. Take care of yourself, Jimmy, he said, and walked out of the television room. Chapter 7 The highway passed by swiftly as Sandra drove back home. There was very little conversation between her and Shirley. When they reached the city limits, Sandra asked her if she wouldn't mind riding with her while she picked up some clothes. For some reason, she felt better with company along as she parked in the garage. On the ride through the city, she had told Shirley a little of what happened. So when Sandra got out of the car, Shirley followed. It didn't take long for the two women to get the few belongings that Sandra wanted. She packed two bags, and as Shirley watched her pack some of the men's clothes, she remained silent, not asking questions that might be none of her business. Well, I guess that just about covers everything, Sandra said, as she glanced around for the last time. You want to come over to my place? Shirley asked. Just until I could find me another place, Sandra answered quietly, then led the way out of the apartment. For the next two days, Sandra searched for an apartment. She finally found a furnished one-bedroom apartment out on 110th and Budlong, well outside of the Los Angeles district. Thursday morning was slow for her. She had exchanged cars, trading in hers for an older model. She had wanted to make sure she got something that wouldn't break down on them while on the highway. Now, with just hours to go, she became nervous. She had moved into her apartment away from Shirley so that the other woman wouldn't expect anything. As the hour of the departure grew near, she began to gather everything she thought they might need. She counted the money she had got out of the bank. It was $1,500, enough to take them just about anywhere Chink might decide they'd need to go. Back at the prison compound, Chink made his way to the dining hall. Jimmy tagged along. He had constantly worried Chink about the chance of going along. Listen, man, he continued, as they sat at the table by themselves. Let me just go along as far as the city. I ain't asking you to take care of me or nothing like that. I just want to get to Los Angeles. I can make it from there. Chink stared at the man coldly. Jimmy... If anything should happen, man, I'd hate that you were involved. I'm going all the way, man, all the motherfucking way, and ain't nothing gonna stop me. You understand that? Nothing, man. I can dig it, Jimmy replied shortly. I'm game to go all the way myself, man. Going against his better judgment, Chink finally agreed. Okay, man, but remember, if anything happens, baby, you begged into the shit. I don't want you along, but if you insist, I'll take you along. Chink turned his head and stared out of one of the dining room windows. What could happen? He went over it for the thousandth time. Nothing. It should go smooth and simple. If Sandra was there on time, if the count went off like it should, they would have an hour or possibly two hours before another count. So what could happen? They should be in Los Angeles by then. There were quite a few ifs involved, but from every angle, it seemed simple. Okay, Jimmy, 
Be ready after the nine o'clock count. But just remember, man, you wanted this, not me. Jimmy smiled. In a few hours, he'd be with his woman. His heart beat faster. It was all he had thought about for the past few days. He knew Chink wouldn't go and leave him, not if he worried him enough, and that was what he had done. From morning to night, until he had worn the man's patience down, now Chink had finally agreed to let him go, and it was going to be tonight. When they left the dining room, Chink stretched out his bunk and began to read. Jimmy was too excited for that. He went outside and walked around the compound, staring into the woods that he knew he'd be in sometime that night. Johnson! The sound of his name was called in a harsh and commanding voice. You keep staring into the woods like that and you'll make me think you've got ideas of getting a little rabbit in you. At the sound of his last name, Jimmy almost jumped out of his skin. He turned around to see the guard standing right behind him. He had been so involved in his thoughts that he hadn't even heard the guard come up behind him. Jimmy grinned and spoke politely. Hi, Officer Williams. I was just thinking about all the times I went hunting back home in the woods. These remind me of them back home, you know. The officer nodded his head and walked on around the young prisoner. He wasn't worried. He had never figured it out. But ever since he worked at the prison compound, no black inmate ever ran away. For some reason, they just didn't run, while the whites were just the opposite. If he had walked up on a white boy gazing through the woods like that, he would have been more than suspicious. But since it had been a black inmate, he quickly forgot about the matter. Later on that night, he would think about it again, but then it would be too late. Chink got up and took a hot shower to ease his nerves. After the shower, he sat on Jimmy's bed and played checkers for a while. The night passed slowly. After the seven o'clock count, the men started racing towards the television room. God damn, Jimmy said again. This waiting is sure enough bad shit. Be cool, man. Just be cool. Time gonna have to pass. Just be cool. Chink cautioned, but he knew how the man felt. Eight o'clock finally came. Just one more hour, Chink told himself. By now, Sandra should already be on the highway. He stretched out on his bunk and imagined her driving down the highway. Thought about Jimmy asking him about Sandra picking him up and his refusal to admit she was the one. For some reason, one he couldn't explain to himself. He hadn't wanted to bring her name into it. Jimmy would find out soon enough who was picking him up. Until then, let him guess. Finally, the bell rang for the nine o'clock count. Chink jumped off his bunk and stood beside his bed. The men lined up quickly. There was a good movie on television and they wanted to get back to the television room and see it. The faster they lined up, the quicker the guard would take count. But the officer passed by slowly, checking off each name as he went past. Chink returned to his bunk, but only leaned on it. Jimmy's face was lit with excitement as he glanced at his partner. Chink waved his hand for Jimmy to be cool, not to act too impatient. As soon as the guard walked out of their wing, the all-clear bell rang. Chink smiled. So far, so good. At least they wouldn't be held up while the guard made a second count. As though he had all the time in the world, Chink opened his locker and took out a small flashlight. He had one of the prisoners on work release bring it back from town. He slipped it in his pocket, then led the way down the corridor to the dining room. All the doors in the place were locked as soon as it became dark. Chink slipped inside the dark dining room and closed the door quickly after Jimmy came through. He held his finger to his mouth so that Jimmy wouldn't speak. He didn't want to take a chance on anyone in the kitchen hearing them. Sometimes the night cook would be on duty. A sharp sound of someone dropping a pot made him thankful he had been careful. The men moved silently across the room. Chink tried a window, then slowly began to open it. After he got the window opened, he beckoned to Jimmy to go on through. He waited while Jimmy climbed out, then let himself out and closed the window. Jimmy let off, running for the woods. Chink cursed under his breath as he tried to catch up with the slim, streaking figure in front of him. Jimmy was entering the woods at the wrong point. This way, they'd have to travel through too much of the woods. Slow down, goddammit! Chink yelled as loud as he dared. Jimmy waited for Chink to catch up. What's wrong, man? I know you didn't want to be fucking around crossing that baseball diamond. 
anybody could have glanced out of one of the dormitory windows and seen us if we fucked around, Jimmy explained as soon as Chink reached him. I wasn't going this way, man. I was going to creep around past the office and stay in the shadows until I reached the fucking highway. Now, we got to go through these fucking woods to reach that goddamn highway, Chink stated. Don't worry about it, Jimmy replied. I know my way around the goddamn woods, so don't let it bother you. I'll bring us right out where you want it to be, and we won't be behind your time schedule. Before Chink could complain, Jimmy let off at a fast dog trot. Chink had to trot to keep up, and he still was way behind. A branch caught his jacket, and he had to stop. The sound of a dog barking ahead put him on his guard. He went forward quietly, moving like a shadow. Suddenly, Chink heard voices in front of him. He crept forward, moving through the woods as if he were one of the night animals whose life depended on caution. As he parted some bushes and glanced out, he saw Jimmy pinpointed in the beam of a flashlight. A farmer held a shotgun on him. In a flash, Chink realized what had happened. Jimmy, running straight ahead, had burst out of the bushes on top of a farmer out doing some coon hunting. For a minute, Chink thought about slipping around them, going on to the highway and catching his ride. If it had gone like he planned, none of this shit would have happened. Now Jimmy was in trouble. Suddenly, the farmer's voice came to him in the bush. By God, I set out to coon hunt tonight, and I sure done caught me a coon, too. The farmer's cold laugh sent a dangerous chill down Chink's spine, and a cold rage overcame him. He knew now that he couldn't allow his friend to stay in the man's cruel grasp. The sound of the farmer's voice aroused all the contained fury in his soul. Suddenly, one of the dogs began to growl near him. Chink knew that he didn't have a choice in the matter anymore. He had to strike and strike as fast as possible. He burst from the bush like a small black bear, moving like a streak. The farmer's dog set up a wild commotion, but it was too late. The farmer whirled, bringing up the shotgun. Chink grabbed the barrel of the gun and snatched it towards him, pulling the farmer off balance. As soon as Chink had the gun in his hands, he struck with the stock, catching the farmer flush in the face. He struck again, an unnecessary blow. Teeth and blood flew everywhere. The dogs barked at his heels, yet none of them had the courage to bite him. He turned the shotgun on them and cut loose with both barrels, killing three of the dogs at once. The rest of the pack bolted for the woods. Jimmy stared down at the farmer as if in a trance. God damn, Chink, you done killed him, he said in awe. His face was flushed, and fear was in his eyes. Man, the son of a bitch is dead, Chink. What we gonna do, man? I ain't plan on no murder. Chink stared at Jimmy. He wished he had saved a load of shot from the shotgun so he could have cut Jimmy down. The nigga was shitting in his pants. Chink made up his mind quickly. Listen, man, you can still get out of this shit. Ain't nobody missed us yet. All you got to do is go back and keep your motherfucking mouth shut. In the morning when they start talking about the rumors, you act like it's the first time you heard anything about it and you'll be alright. Chink wiped the sweat off his brow. He couldn't go back. He had a debt to pay and nothing would come between him and that debt. Jimmy looked at him in wonder. You sure, man? I mean, you don't mind if I get from under it like that? I hate to pull out on you, Chink, but murder, man? I just didn't think nothing like this would happen. Chink glanced down at the dead white man at his feet before he could reply. He hadn't planned on no murder either. There wouldn't have been one if he had come by himself, but he didn't mention it. What had happened had happened. Nothing could change it. The white man was dead, so be it. It wasn't going to stop him from finding them niggas who raped his woman. That he was sure of. You do what you want to do, Chink said. I got a ride to catch. I don't want my man to be on the highway waiting and I don't show up. It would be better not to let this fool know that Sandra was the one picking him up, Chink decided again. He set off through the woods, not bothering to look back. Chink didn't even bother to wave goodbye. He didn't really trust himself in Jimmy's company. He was too tempted to kill the man. 
Jimmy watched Chink disappear into the woods. For a moment, he wanted to follow, but something warned him that that would be the foolish thing to do. He better get back to the campgrounds as fast as possible and get this murder rap off his back. Once he made count, it would be Chink's case, no matter what Chink said later on. After leaving Jimmy, Chink made a beeline straight for the highway. He reached it out of breath, and he stayed in the bush until he saw a car coming slowly down the highway. He took the small flashlight out of his pocket and blinked it twice. The car suddenly picked up speed. It came to a fast stop right in front of the bushes. Sandra reached over and opened the door as Chink ran from the bushes. He jumped in quickly. Let's get the fuck out of here, he said harshly, breathing hard. She stepped down on the gas, glancing in the mirror to see if there was any traffic behind them. Did everything go as smooth as you planned, she asked quietly. He slowly shook his head, then explained to her what had happened. It just goes to show, baby, that you can't do somebody else a motherfucking favor. Now, I got a motherfucking murder charge against me, while that bastard is back at the camp making sure his ass is safe. If I hadn't drug his sorry ass long, none of this fucking bullshit would have happened. What will happen if he got busted on the way back, she inquired quickly. If that happens, baby, you can bet there will be a roadblock ahead of us somewhere. Cause the motherfucker ain't about to keep his motherfucking mouth shut. No, baby, if that nigga gets caught, it's all up for us. For a few minutes, Sandra was silent, thinking over what her man had said. Baby, you think I should get off the highway just in case something happened? Nah, if we get off the highway, we won't know where the fuck we at. Fucking around in any of these small towns around here is trouble. I think our best bet is to stick to the highway and hope for the best. This is the fastest route back to the city, so just keep your foot on the gas. Just don't go fast enough for the highway patrol to stop us. I still got these fucking prison clothes on. She pointed over her shoulder. All you got to do is climb back there in the back seat. I'm sure you'll find something that will fit you a lot better than that shit you got on. She grinned as he smiled at her for the first time since entering the car. Chink quickly climbed in the back seat and changed clothes. When he finished, he let down the window and tossed the prison clothes out, shoes and all. I feel like a new man now, he said as he climbed back up front. Damn, it feels good just to have some decent rags, baby. Sandra glanced at the speedometer, then took her foot off the gas pedal. She had been doing close to a hundred. This car sure has a lot of pep, she said, trying to say something lightly to take his mind off his worries. Yeah, heavy foot, he said as he slid over beside her. Just keep it on 80, baby. That will be fast enough. He leaned over and kissed her neck, then smelled the perfume she was wearing. Damn, baby, that sure smells nice. Always wear it. Silence fell on the couple in the car. They drove through the night, and when they reached the city limits, Chink spoke to Sandra quietly. Honey, I don't never want to go back alive, since I know they'll never let me out. I couldn't do life in prison. I just couldn't stand it. You understand? It ain't for me, baby. I'm gonna hold court in the streets wherever they stop me. That's gonna be my court day. You hear what I'm saying? She glanced at him. I hear... And I understand, Daddy. I don't think I could stand seeing you behind bars for the rest of your life either. I mean it, Chink. I just couldn't stand the thought of you being there because of me. None of this would have happened if it wasn't for me, Daddy. I realize that. So I'm with you to the end. If it ain't but a day or a month or a year, whatever it is, we're together, honey. For Chink, just the words she said were enough to make everything worthwhile. No matter what time he had, he had the love of a woman. One who loved him as much as he loved her. He glanced at her bandaged face and remembered his obligation. It will be paid, no matter what the cost. I got us an apartment out on 110th, Daddy. Should we go there now? Sandra inquired as they came up off the freeway. Uh-uh, baby. Did you get that other thing I told you about? He asked. It's in the glove compartment, chink. But shouldn't we go home and rest first, daddy? No, baby. In the morning, half the city will know I'm out. We got plenty of business to take care of tonight, he stated, and he removed the pistol from the glove compartment. He examined the gun closely. It was a good one. A 38 police special. Take me to 51st and Western, baby. I want to pay my friend George a visit before he finds out I'm home and hides somewhere in a hole like the motherfucker. Fucking rap bastard he really is.
She didn't bother to argue. He had made up his mind, so all she had to do was follow his wishes. She parked in front of the apartment building he pointed out. As Chink got out of the car, she asked, Should I come along, Daddy? Chink shook his head. Nah, baby, you don't need to come. Just as long as you know I'll handle it, that's good enough, he said and closed the car door. Chink was not like other men. He didn't need the company of another person to help him find the nerve to do something unpleasant. He knew what he had to do and went about doing it without asking help from anyone. He made his way up to the second floor and knocked on the apartment door. Who is it? came the inquiring voice of a woman. Is George home, honey? Tell him the man with the bag is here. I want you to test some stuff for me, he said. And before the words were out of his mouth, the door was opening. As Chink barged in, the woman stepped back in surprise, her hand flying to her mouth. That's right, baby. It's me, Chink. Looks like you know that punk you got done did me wrong, don't you? George came out of the bedroom wearing nothing but his shorts. What the fuck is going on in here? He asked sharply. But as soon as he saw Chink, he started to back up. Just freeze right there, punk, Chink ordered harshly. He waved his gun at George's woman. You find a chair and sit down in it, he ordered, as the woman quickly followed his command. George came out of the bedroom explaining, They made me do it, Chink. They made me. They come by here to cop, man, and stuck me up. Then they forced me to take him over to Sandra's house. I didn't want to do it, man, but they made me. You can understand that, can't you? I tried. I mean, I really tried. And when they started that shit with Sandra, I really tried to stop it, man. Didn't she tell you I didn't want no parts of it, man? No kind of parts of it. Chink just stared at him. I want you to tell me just what they did to my woman. And if you let anything out... I'll know, cause she already told me what happened. I just want to see how close to the truth you can come, Chink ordered. George came into the room and sat down on the floor. He began to talk, and as he talked, the tighter Chink's jaw became. Sandra had told him everything except the sodomy part. She had kept that back, mostly because she was ashamed of what had been done to her. Chink could hardly trust his voice to ask, Don't that nigga tree still stay over on 41st near Hoover? George shook his head. Nah, Chink, he moved over to 9th Avenue, apartment 10. He stays there with his sister. She's got three kids and gets a check every month. She's scared to death of him, so she can't put him out. And his partner Fred? What about his home life? Chink asked quietly. George wiped the sweat off his brow. He was going to get out of it yet, he believed. Chink wasn't really mad at him. He just wanted Tree and Fred. After all, they were the ones who did it. He hadn't done anything and hadn't gotten a thing out of it except for the one balloon. Fred stays with his mother over at Van Ness. He hesitated for a moment, trying to think. It's the house right next to the alley. You shouldn't have any trouble finding it. George grinned at Chink as if they were partners. If you should miss Fred at home, man, he's always up to the pool room near the mug on Western. You can't help but to find him at one of them spots. George's woman looked at him and turned up her nose. Chink didn't miss the action. What's wrong, missy? Chink asked. You don't like to hear your man snitch like that? She looked at Chink. If he was a man, he wouldn't have told you anything, she said, safe in the belief that nothing was going to happen to her. She hadn't been involved, even though she had helped talk George into getting Tree's help and taking off the robbery. Tree had given her two balloons for her own, but it hadn't been what she had hoped to get. The first bullet caught her high in the chest, and the second one split her nose wide open. George just sat and stared dumbfounded. He couldn't believe that Chink had shot his woman, and then death was on him before he realized it. Chink had put the gun up. With his strong hands, he reached down and gripped George's thin neck. The smaller man was like a child in his hands. He struggled, but it was all in vain. Chink held him at arm's length and slowly choked him to death. It was a slow death death as the man kicked and wiggled and struggled but chink never stopped the pressure
When he stepped out of the apartment, people were standing in the hallway. The gunshot noise had drawn them out of their filthy, roach-infested apartments to stare in wonder. Violence was not new to them, but it was always interesting. It would give them something to talk about the rest of the week. Chink brushed past them as if they weren't even there. The people stood in the hall and watched him walk away. No one tried to stop him. There was something about him that put fear in them. He never glanced one way or the other. This concludes this portion of the miniseries in Ralph Reads. I would like to thank you queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me on Twitter and Instagram as well as Periscope at RGMC2407. Drop me an email at RGMC2407 at gmail.com where if you would like to leave a small donation, you may use the Zelle app or paypal.me for slash RGMC2407 or the cash app. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also find me on my very own channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, as well as right here at home on the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of Ralph Reads. Quaheri.